Hello, I'm Veronica Wigno, I'm from Advertising and Ad Free Cities, um, where I work across our campaigns, looking at advertising as the nexus between individual um, and systems change. And I'm going to try and be talking about how we can, what, what's the issue with the advertising that we're exposed to now, and, and what can we do about it? Um, so for anyone who hasn't previously come across Ad Free Cities and Advertising, um, Ad Free Cities is a small campaign group based in Bristol, which is where I am now. Um, and we campaign to reduce the harms caused by advertising, particularly corporate advertising in public space, big billboards and the impacts they have on our lives. Um, this is um, a protest by Adblock Bristol. We support a network of volunteer groups who um, kind of lead resident led campaigns against um, new digital advertising infrastructure in their local areas. It's obviously very heavily linked to consumption patterns. Um, and Advertising is a campaign, um, a project of the New Weather Institute and um, the Climate Charity Possible, which specifically works to end advertising that fuels the climate emergency, adds by fossil fuel companies, car makers and airlines to start with as kind of the most polluting sectors with other things on the horizon, like um, meat and dairy advertising, advertising for tech and fast fashion and other things that lead to generally high emissions, particularly in wealthier countries um, and also kind of high waste streams. Um, and overall, just to give the kind of summary of what advertising is aiming towards and this kind of um, the policy solution that we're advocating for is to look at a tobacco style ban on fossil fuel advertising and sponsorships um, or extending fossil fuels out to high carbon. Um, and within that, there's opportunities for individual changes and systems level change and drastic policy shifts to make sure that the, the advertising that we see isn't isn't supporting such heavily emitting consumption patterns as it is now. Um, and this looks back to quite a, a strong precedent in the world of health, um, where it used to be very common to see adverts for tobacco um, sponsorships around sports stadiums for um, smoking tobacco companies um, and a very strong health professional led campaign um, really helped to end tobacco marketing and sponsorships and we now don't really see that and that's led to a decrease in this very harmful um, behavior and we can look at um, yeah and had a very good tradition of billboard editing and as as part of this campaign to reduce the amount of advertising seen for an unhealthy behavior and looking at climate breakdown as one of the or as the leading threat to global health um, it's time to start thinking about the advertising we're seeing um, around us every day this is an ad for BP, which is kind of typical of the types of fossil fuel adverts you might be seeing. Um, and you can say that we, we talk a lot about how advertising is the, the cultural water that we swim in and also how you might think that it's not necessarily something that's impacting you, but actually um, it's surrounding us all the time. It's so present as to almost be invisible. You could walk down, I think this is Westminster tube station, and perhaps not even think about this huge advert that's basically telling you oil and gas is good, BP is good. Um, here's a company that's looking out for your interest with backing Britain. A lot of these narratives are quite similar across fossil fuel companies. Here's Shell telling us in a, in a recent ad campaign that they're helping power the UK now and into the future. And um, there's wind turbines and engineers and um, yeah, very typical fossil fuel narratives. And all of this is pushing us into consumption patterns that favor fossil fuels and prevent us unlocking sustainable behavior change and, and an economic shift away from fossil fuels. Um, this is Equinor talking about carbon bombs. Equinor, the lead stakeholder in the Rosebank oil and gas field. Um, here's an ad campaign that actually got advice from the then Chancellor Jeremy Hunt on uh, how messaging might land with the British public. It's all part of the broader energy picture. We're talking about jobs, we're talking about wind, we're talking about carbon capture. Here's a picture of an engineer in a clean blue sea. This ad was placed in the in the run-up to the Rosebank decision broadly placed across um, London's transport networks and The Economist and lots of other kind of um, public facing and civil servant facing, um, policymaker facing media. And then um, lo and behold, a few months later, the UK regulators approved plans for the Rosebank oil field and that carbon bomb was given permission to go ahead whilst now under, under some um, debate. Um, and this brings a quick point that we come across quite a lot where um, policymakers might say we have an advertising regulator who deals with with polluting advertising there's no problem here but it's, it's being regulated the advertising regulator did ban these adverts for greenwashing for misleading um consumers and decision makers but 
that wasn't until way after the damage was done. I think it was in December 2023 and Rosebank was approved more around September 2023. So regulation isn't isn't um, acting to rein in the harms caused by advertising. Again, thinking about the, the influence that advertising is having on a daily basis, let's think about um, more and more of the polluting elite choosing to fly a lot. There's a lot, um, a lot of flying and it's very, um, very unequal in the patterns of who is able to fly. Um, surrounded by aviation adverts all the time and aviation is one of the sectors that projected to grow rapidly um, and is really hard to decarbonize. So we need to think about demand side solutions. And let's stop promoting it as a as a carbon bomb example. Um, car makers also are pushing larger and larger cars with a larger and larger emissions footprint and materials footprint. Um, research by the New Weather Institute and um, yeah, New Weather found that compared to someone who rarely sees any adverts for SUVs, someone who sees those adverts sometimes is about 70% more likely to own an SUV than a normal size car, and about 250% more likely to own um, an SUV than no car at all. Okay, so looking at how this is looking on, um, on a kind of international level, on the right I've listed lots of places, whether that's towns, villages, or whole nations who have started to put in place restrictions on fossil fuel advertising and high carbon advertising. And it has support from the UN with Antonio Guterres calling all go governments and also um, media organizations and advertising agencies to drop fossil fuel advertising and sponsorship in a bid to reduce emissions. Um, so this, if we zoom in from this large um, group of, of places, which is actually quite a lot in Australia and the Netherlands, um, some in France and Switzerland, um, into the UK. Recently, Edinburgh Council banned adverts for fossil fuel advertising, um, and that's fossil fuel companies, so including kind of greenwash ads for wind farms and so on, um, SUVs, cruise ships, and um, anything that might promote flying. So whether that's a holiday abroad, advert for a holiday abroad, or um, an ad for a flight or an airline. Um, and Sheffield City Council have also done a similar thing. Interestingly, really spurred on by conversations around health and air pollution and the impacts of um, climate breakdown on, on health. So yeah, thinking about more broadly, we talked a lot about, and, and we focus a lot on um, the most emitting sectors and their advertising and how it impacts us. But just think about like what where we're, where we're going, what's the direction of travel? How is advertising influencing our, our behavioral patterns, our patterns of consumption, again, particularly in wealthier countries? This, this is an artwork by um, an artist called Bill Posters, which kind of neatly presents the, what advertising is giving us. We're being given a sort of dystopic future where all we have is waste and um, and low well-being. We ha might have all the things that we want, material goods that we want, but perhaps there's much less happiness and much, much less um, ecological sustainability. So thinking about advertising, not only as a tool to reduce the, the top most high emitting categories from being promoted and greenwashed um, and upholding their social license, but also a force to propel us into a life guided by consumption. Addressing that is, is really important. And one tool that we can use to address that, to help us towards the, the radical shifts we need in how we frame ourselves as, as um, people with political agency rather than simply consumers. Let's remove advertising on aggregate as well as introduce category bans on those most polluting ads. So whether you're using a spray, spray can or any kind of activism you can think of, political advocacy, joining a local campaign group. There's plenty of ways to get involved in, in campaigning that reduces the space for advertisers to um, manipulate us and lead the way that we live. Um, advertising has lots of um, options to get in touch with your councillor, get in touch with your MP, call for local policies like in Edinburgh and Sheffield, also Coventry, Basingstoke and Dean, uh, um, Somerset and other places so you can have a local local action to address the advertising that surrounds your local area as well as lobbying up for that national tobacco style ban um, and ad free cities and advertising work together to kind of reduce the amount of advertising that is actually present in public space and it's very possible to um, object to planning applications in your local area to mean that even if it's on a case-by-case -case basis, one less billboard is, is a lot less consumption 
Um, and that also produces is aiming to produce a groundswell of support for national policy that makes it harder for more advertising to be um, to proliferate in in public space. This is an example of um, Lyon, who have, as I think the second biggest um, metropole in France, has banned digital advertising screens completely and removed plenty that are already in the city. And that follows places like Lancy and Vernier in Switzerland um, and Grenoble as well. Also just a very beautiful piece of artwork. Um, and yeah, just a kind of final thought on how removing the call to consume is really necessary, not only for our own well-being and to kind of address issues around inequality as well, but also to open space in our minds about how we see the future and what we can um, what we can imagine for ourselves and for policy and for our economy. Um, yeah, I will not go on much longer about that, but yeah, looking forward to answering any questions. Thanks.